am excited to introduce uh, from Kohler High School, we have Cecilia Zilke and her teacher, Mr. Matthew Byans, who are here to talk about a wonderful opportunity that they had with National History Day. If you looked out in our exhibit out there, you probably saw their faces in a picture out there. So they are very steeped in National History Day and had a great opportunity to study uh, in the, Nas or the National History Day Normandy Institute. So I will give it to them for them to explain that more. Okay, um, so for those of you who haven't heard about National History Day, um, what it is is it's a program throughout the U.S. where you create historical projects um, or projects based on historical topics. Um, so I've been doing it since sixth grade, and Mr. Byans was my teacher in sixth grade when we started doing this. And um, so what we did last year was we actually applied to a program through National History Day um, called the Normandy Sacrifice for Freedom Student and Teacher Institute. Um, so we'll t here's a few more pictures of, of our National History Day experience. Um, but then we'll move on. So this program is run um, through National History Today and also the George Washington University. And basically um, what, who established this was Albert H. Small. And he was a philanthropist, or he's now a philanthropist in DC and was once a real estate developer. But when he went to Normandy, um, he, was, he was a veteran in Normandy. And when he returned, um, he realized that he really wanted to convey um, the sacrifice that the soldiers in, that fought in Normandy during World War II to my generation and um, the generations in the U.S. So one of his first ideas was to actually um, get planes uh, coming from D.C. and fly them over the Atlantic and bring as many people as possible into Normandy. And he asked one of his friends about this, and his friend said, you know what, that's probably not going to work. Um, but so instead they developed this program called the Albert H. Small Normandy Institute. And so what it is is each year um, Nor uh, National History Day and then George Washington University accept 15 students and teachers from around the nation. And then you study um, Normandy um, first digitally and then next you actually go to the George Washington University and then you go to Normandy. Um, and then the, f the students on, uh, throughout the experience conduct research and on a soldier. And then when they return, um, Albert wanted us to present to our communities about our experience so he could um, convey the message of sacrifice um, through us. So, yeah, Mr. Just a little plug for Mr. Uh, Albert H. Small. This was all funded from him. We had to pay nothing for any of this. So... Um, being a philanthropist, um, the, one of the things, one of the last things we did before we went to Normandy uh, was visit his own museum. He has his own museum on the campus of uh, George Washington. Like, I want my own museum. <laughs> and it, was, it, was, it was pretty neat. He was, uh, he was uh, really amazing. And as part of the research, um, we read some amazing um, stories and excerpts and firsthand accounts. And we have a collection of the books up here that we've read. And maybe you're familiar with the Bedford uh, Boys, a fantastic um, account. And Bedford is where the uh, Normandy National uh, Memorial is in Bedford, Virginia, a uh, place that we haven't been to that we constantly talk about that we'd like to visit. Uh, but amaz amazing program. Yes. So, um, like I mentioned before, we started this experience, um, we applied last fall. Um, through National History Day, so we had to write um, several essays, and then we found out that we got in in January of this past year, or of 2018. So, um, so we ended up working with 15 other students and teachers from around the country. So this is a picture of me. So I'm up here, right there, and then these are the 14 other students that I was working with um, during the experience. Um, so we started out this experience doing digital research. Um, so we did this through a program called Schoology, and what it was was we read um, those books and then um, a lot of other like primary sources about the Normandy invasion so we could just get an idea of the context before we actually went to Normandy. Um, so one of the tasks that we had to do through this was research a silent hero from our state um, who was a Wisconsin veteran that actually fought in the Normandy campaign and then died um, on D-Day or shortly after. Um, so we'll go into more details on our hero now. So um, just to talk a little bit, um, 
about the war coming into the U.S. Um, so first, it was there was like a lend-lease policy between the U.S. and Britain. So first, the U.S. didn't really want to go into war, um, so they were kind of reluctant to go into it just because of what happened with World War I. Um, but then Pearl Harbor happened, and then we went into war. So the home front... And then, so I'll talk about the home front and our silent hero. So we chose um, our silent hero to be Corporal Joseph Brigham. And so what we had to do was we went um, to the American Battle Monuments Commission, um, which has which do has documented all the soldiers from every state um, who fought in various campaigns throughout U.S. history. Um, so we chose jo Joseph Brigham because mainly because he was an engineer in World War II. And the Normandy Institute hadn't heard of a lot of engineers, um, hadn't done a lot of research on them. So we wanted to um, document his experience. And Corporal Joseph Brigham was from Cashin, Wisconsin. Um, so that's in Monroe County, and it's kind of near the center of the state. Um, I think we'll show a map later. Um, but so the first thing we had to do was look at census records on ancestry. Um, and I believe, well, so, okay, so here's a map. So this is Cashin, Wisconsin. Um, the red dot is shown on the map there. Um, and then this is a picture of his unit, um, which was taken in Madison when he was, dr he was drafted into the war. And then there's a picture of him on the left. In doing years and years of re research with working with students at NHD, sometimes you struggle early on finding anything about your topic, and that's where we were. And um, Cecilia's been doing a lot of research on different topics over the years, and we were actually kind of frustrated. Um, the, the coordinator said, don't worry about that. You may not find a lot. It's not who finds the most wins or anything like that. So we really struggled to find a lot of information. Um, Cecilia talked about the census records, but there was a wow moment that happened to us so um, early on we, we were like do we pick the right person because yeah. there was very little information because sometimes they said that people actually don't even find pictures of their silent hero um, so we were thinking that might be us but um, fortunately it wasn't so um, so these are some of the census records that we um, looked at first so we were instructed to go on to ancestry um, which the National History Day program actually gave our school a grant for. Um, but so this is one of the first things that we found. So um, down here, you can just kind of see his family. So um, Corporal Brigham's father died, um, passed away when he was very young. Um, but his mother was still alive. Um, and this is the 1930 census, census records from Wisconsin. Um, so his mother, Agnes, was still alive. So. We found out that she owned a farm from this information and that um, Corporal Joseph or Joseph Brigham actually still worked on that farm at that time. And actually, we found out from other censuses um, that he still worked on the farm up to the time he was drafted into the war. Um, and from this, we also found out that he had three brothers, Matt, Herman, and Edward, and then one sister, which, whose name was actually Cecilia, too, um, which was interesting. So... And then just a little bit more about the home front. Um, so Joseph Brigham, like we mentioned, he owned a farm. Um, but during the Great Depression, um, the, the prices of crops, um, they were trying to increase them because there was such a surplus of crops in the U.S. Um, so the Agricultural Adjustment Act um, took place as part of the New Deal in Wisconsin. Um, but also during the Great Depression, there was a huge movement of um, farmers from rural to urban areas. Um, so we saw that, but then when World War II happened, they needed more crops to reinforce the troops. Um, so there are actually farm deferments granted um, in uh, four soldiers, oh, excuse me, sorry, um, for soldiers who didn't uh, thought that they would do more good at home than actually going to war. Um, so we didn't see this with Corporal Joseph Brigham in, which we thought was um, kind of an honorable characteristic. Um, okay. And then um, just a little bit more about the home front. Um, we had to research the home front as one of the aspects of our research on Corporal Joseph Brigham in. Um, so in Monroe County, Wisconsin, there was a fort called Fort McCoy. And I know I talked to a couple other people that had been there um, today, but you can still go today. 
Um, we're hoping to do that this summer. But um, so it's in Sparta, Wisconsin, and during the Great Depression, it was um, a location for the Civilian Conservation Corps. And um, then in World War II, in 1940, it became a location where they did the Second Army maneuvers um, of World War II. So they had over 65,000 soldiers from the Midwest train here. Um, and then they also had nurse basic training and then a limited service school. So for um, soldiers who are physically disabled, um, they had them train here and learn um, some like radio skills and other things. Um, so then um, another interesting point, it was also a prisoner of war camp. Um, so it had Japanese, Korean, and German soldiers um, at this fort. And we found this picture um, in a Sun Prairie newspaper. And it claims to be um, Japanese uh, prisoners of war outside of their barracks at Fort McCoy. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then it was also a Japanese relocation center. Um, it was a rather small one, um, but it was also that. So that's an interesting, another interesting thing we found in our research. Um, and then this is some correspondence from the Monroe County Historical Society, which really helped us in our research um, of Corporal Joseph Brighaman. Um, so this was kind of the wow moment, as Mr. Vines was talking about. So um, we'd been contacting um, the curator of this historical society, and he found um, 26 pages of correspondence that Corporal Joseph Brighaman wrote um, to his family while he was stationed in both England and France. Um, during the war. So this told us a lot about his, his experience and we'll mention some of the stuff um, later when we talk about our experience in France. Um, but a lot of it was that he saw in the Norman countryside um, kind of very similar things to what there was in Wisconsin, which was interesting. One of the other things is the um, military edited all correspondence going home and, and we noticed that some of the pages were the exact same but they were in different handwriting. Um, so you, you could tell that and and very little information about where he was or what he was doing. It was all about almost like civilian life, like he was living, like what he was eating, you know, uh, going to mass, you know, very religious. Yeah. Um, so really insight into who he was, even more than just his military experiences. Yes. Um, so now we'll kind of talk about our experience at George Washington. So after we finished doing this digital research, um, we went to D.C. this past summer for a week, um, and we studied more um, from professors at George Washington about the Normandy invasion. Um, so our opening dinner was with Mr. Albert H. Small, who we discussed before. So we actually got to meet him, um, which was a great experience. And then we met some other, um, another um, person who was actually working as a beachhead, um, Beachmaster. Beachmaster, excuse me, in the Normandy invasion. Um, so he was a veteran, and he was 105 years old. Um, so we got to hear um, he was going, actually going to speak, but instead he just gave us um, what he was going to say. He had someone else read it for him because he was so old. Um, but that was a fantastic experience to meet those veterans. Um, and then just to talk a little bit more about the presenters that we saw, we saw... Um, quite a few professors of history from George Washington University, and they talked about um, various topics from um, the French resistance um, all the way to, like, the Nazi regime in the war, um, just to get, give us background about the Normandy invasion. Um, and then we also heard from a colonel at West Point, and then um, Julian Hipkins III, who spoke to us at Arlington, um, about some of the soldiers who fought in Normandy who were buried there, um, and he was from D.C. Public Schools. Uh, the students that participated were engaged a lot. Um, these professors took a semester's worth of material and condensed it to about two hours, so it was amazing. The amount of information they were shared and, um, and the interaction with the students, uh, they, they were just, you know, two, three hours for kids to sit to do anything these days, but they, they, were, they were engaged uh, every, every time. It was just amazing, that, that research and knowledge that they gave us. Yeah. So this is a picture from like one of the classrooms that we were in um, with some of the other students and teachers. Okay. So then we were also in D.C. Um, at this time, because George Washington is in D.C., um, so we were there for six days, and um, besides learning from these professors in D.C., um, we went to the monuments and memorials. So we went to the World War II memorial um, in D.C., and then also the Holocaust Memorial Museum, 
And then, like I said before, we went to Arlington and actually focused on soldiers um, who had been in the Normandy invasion who were buried there. Uh, while we were at the Holocaust, I don't, we uh, got to hear a, from a Holocaust survivor um, amazing story of how her family, much like Anne Frank, um, kind of escaped the persecution. And um, to make a long story short, the, the, the girl was six years old, and with her and her brother and her family, lived in this apartment for almost seven years. She didn't see the outside world until she was like 12 or 13. Um, can't imagine. They just never saw trees, never saw any other people. Um, that's, and she shared that experience of being in, with her family and then uh, getting into the outside world after six years. It was, it was just an incredible yeah, story. I remember <laughs> her saying like she didn't even want to be outside because of like how bright it was. Yeah. And, and seeing other yeah. people was just terrifying for her. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ma so, amazing. Yeah, that was interesting. Okay. So these are some more um, pictures from D.C. Um, so it was interesting. We were actually there on Father's Day. So um, they decorated the memorials um, with roses. And I don't remember exactly which colors the roses represented, but some were for fathers, some were for um, grandfathers, but of these people who had all um, passed away and were represented on the memorials. Um, yes. Okay, and then one of the opportunities that we had while we were in D.C. was going to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. Um, so what we actually had to do first was we had to go get a researcher card, and for that we went to the National Archives that you'd probably think of um, that are in D.C., um, that house, the Declaration of Independence, and some of those documents. Um, but then we actually went um, to the National Archives in College Park, and this facility um, is the largest archival facility in the U.S., and um, it's just a massive structure, and I was surprised by how large it was. Um, but So what happened was we were paired up with a researcher um, who's named Ken Whitney, and we'd been paired up with him also in like the digital part of our research. Um, so we told him everything that we found out about Corporal Joseph Brigham in. And then what he would do is he would pull stuff at the National Archives for us um, in the months leading up to it um, that would had, have information on the unit that Corporal Joseph Brigham was in. So he was part of the 342nd Engineer General Service Regiment during World War II. Um, so Mr. Whitney pulled boxes for us, which you can see here, um, from textual records, photographic records, and then cartographic records, so map records. Um, so we had the opportunity to look through all of those, and we only had one day there, um, which might seem like a lot of time, but it definitely was not a lot of time. Um, we, we probably could have stayed there for the whole time we were in D.C., but so that was really interesting. Um, we didn't actually find any pictures of Corporal Joseph Brigham in, um, in the records, but we found, found a lot of his unit, um, which I believe I'll show you a little bit later, um, which we'll talk about um, in, when we talk about our experience in France. So then we actually traveled to Normandy. Um, so what we did was we had five days there, and we stayed in Bayou, France, um, which is a town that was the first to be liberated, so it was still largely intact. Um, however, when you went to other towns, um, they were largely destroyed and because of the invasion. Um, so it was um, a really neat experience to be in Bayou. Um, we'll actually talk a little bit about it more later, but there's a picture over there that Mr. Byans got from Bayou um, that shows the Notre Dame Cathedral in Bayou, which was actually built before the Notre Dame in Paris. So. Um, that's interesting. Okay, um, so this is just kind of a map of the invasion. So we'll talk a little bit more about what we learned about the invasion now. Um, but um, this is a map of where um, each force entered Normandy through. Okay, so the Nazi enemy. So um, revenge of World War I was the underlying cause um, for Hitler's um, development of um, this, of, or initiation of World War I. Um, so some characteristics of Nav Nor uh, sorry, excuse me, Nazi Germany that we learned about um, in, uh, from the professors at George Washington University um, were that they were largely driven um, by, like, they were driven more so than other enemies and that they would fight to the death. Um, so that was something interesting that we learned. Um, 
And then also another thing, though, was that um, the German and the German Nazi Party actually thought that the invasion would be happening at other points in France and not um, in the Normandy coast. And this was largely because of a deception um, kind of operation that the U.S. instituted, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but for this reason, they actually had Eastern European and Polish units stationed in Normandy and not their top SS forces, um, which was kind of interesting. So we'll just give you some background now. So um, the Maginot Line was where um, uh, Germany invaded France from. Um, so Germany invaded France, and then um, the Nazis occupied Paris, and then, okay, so I'll show you on this map. So there's an occupied zone, which is in the red on the map, and then there's the free zone. Um, so the occupied zone was still largely controlled by the Nazi forces, and then the free zone was controlled um, by the Vichy, Vichy regime, um, which was a government that um, the French technically developed, but it was still largely um, collaborating with the Nazi forces. Um, so the people that were actually in support of the French Republic um, were actually a large part of the French resistance, which was kind of more of an underground movement. And the leader of this movement was Charles de Gaulle. Um, so he fled to London. Um, so, and we'll talk about this on, okay. Yeah, so in the French resistance. So this is Charles de Gaulle. And so he was in London, um, I believe, Mr. Bynes, do you remember the date he fled to London? I think it was. It was. Like June 12th, I want to say. Yeah, 1940. So June 12th, 1940. Yep. So, um, so he was in London, and he was running this French resistance movement um, through London. So what he did was he actually communicated with people in France that wanted to be part of this resistance movement and weren't necessarily supportive of um, the Nazi party. Um, so what he did was he... Uh, um, communicated by radio with them. So he had several appeal, appeals um, that were very popular um, that you can still listen to today on the, um, like you'll find them on YouTube. Um, but what they did was they advocated for this movement, um, this resistance movement. And um, these people, what they did, they, they developed some um, more militia-like units. Um, so they actually fought against some of the Nazis. So there were several, um, like, uprisings, but um, what they also did was they found ways to communicate with the American forces and the British forces in England. Um, so an interesting story about this was actually um, Café Gondre, and um, so we went to Café Gondre when we were in France, um, but it was near Pegasus Bridge, so it was one of the first places where the Allies landed um, in France um, during the Normandy invasion. And so what happened was this family, uh, the Gondre family, um, was living in Normandy, and they'd been there um, for a very long time, but they spoke both German and French um, and English. So what they did was um, they were part of this resistance movement, and they had decided to communicate with um, some of the Allied forces. And so what Mr. Gondre did, who was the owner of this cafe, um, was he spoke, he pretended that he didn't speak German, and he would listen into the German uh, soldiers' conversations that were um, coming to his cafe to eat when the uh, Nazis had occupied the Normandy region. And then um, he would communicate with an Allied commander and tell them um, what the plans for the German forces were. And one of the things that the Germans were doing was building this Atlantic Wall at that time, um, which would prevent the Allies from entering Normandy. Um, so it w that was a really interesting story to hear. And this cafe was still standing. And actually, um, the lady who served us lunch at the cafe was his um, daughter, who was one year old at the time of the invasion. Um, so she was actually at this cafe um, when the invasion occurred on June 6, 1944. So that was really cool. And the area of the cafe is where the uh, British gliders were the first ones in behind enemy lines. And we were able to walk and see the places where they, where they landed. And much of it was swamp area as yeah. well. Uh, and so the, the idea to, to hold that Pegasus Bridge was, was critical at the beginning of the invasion. So um, 
We'll just give you a little bit more context. So Operation Overlord was the name for the D-Day invasion. Um, so Operation Neptune, um, so uh, you can talk a little bit more about this. So one of the things that Professor Long, who was kind of our, our lead professor, talked about, it's that it was massive, it was complex, and it was uncertain. Um, it, for myself, teaching middle school students about World War II, it's now so much more difficult because I know so much more about it. Um, the overview starts to become um, the details, and uh, so th that's a good thing, I guess. Um, the sheer numbers and supplies, um, the mobilization started in 1943, over a year before. Um, the uncertainty, there were so many things that had to go right. Um, they had to be at the right tide when they crossed the channel. They had to be uh, at, a, at a full moon cycle. So all these things had to, had to line up, and then there was still the uncertainty. Are, is this even going to happen? If it doesn't happen, you know, um, are the allies doomed, doomed to lose the war? Um, so the preparation, I think there's some, some things yeah. with pictures with that as well, um, was, was, just, was just massive. It started, you know, um, so, so much longer, you know, 18 months before the actual invasion started. Yeah. Okay. So then I mentioned the Atlantic wall. wall before. So this is what the Nazi forces were um, building in the time leading up to the Normandy invasion. Um, so they kind of knew that the Allies would invade at some point. Um, but they weren't sure exactly when or where. Um, so they built this all along the Atlantic coast. And I think we'll show you another map. Um, but this uh, um, extended from Cherbourg, which is on the far western side of France, um, all the way up to Pas de Calais, which is on the eastern side of this coastal area. Um, but so some of the things that were part of this Atlantic wall um, is, I don't know if you've seen pictures, um, but there's um, like things actually on the beaches, um, like barbed wire and crosses um, that you'll see um, that were preventing them from entering the beaches. But then also they were worried about air invasions. Um, so they had actually flood some valleys in the Normandy region um, prior um, to the invasion um, to prevent uh, gliders from landing and such. And then there were also these things that were interesting called Rommel's asparagus. Um, but what they were was um, essentially they took trees and they stripped them all of all the branches and put them up in fields, um, again, to prevent gliders from landing. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, and then, so these are some of the pictures um, from when from one of the spots um, just off of the beach that we found. Um, so these were some of the um, weapons that the Nazis had set up um, as uh, part of the The pillbox, they really refer yeah. to the gunnery sites as pillboxes. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, they were not very accurate um, in actually firing, so they didn't end up hitting a lot of the American forces. Um, so these are, this is just a picture of the Allied leadership, and this was actually when they were discussing whether or not um, they would go in, uh, because the weather was a large concern. Um, they actually were planning the D-Day invasion for June 3rd and 4th, um, but the weather, um, there was a huge storm that came in on those days, um, and they thought that on the, f the night of the 5th, there would be kind of like an eye in the storm, um, so they were considering either going in on the 5th, which they eventually did, or actually moving it back um, to June 18th when the tide would be correct, like the correct um, height again. So um, they actually decided to go in on the 5th, as we said. But this is a picture of them discussing that. We also have a picture that we were all given from Albert H. Small, which is um, General Eisenhower talking to the troops um, um, the night, the, pre the preparation the night before, we're ready to go. One of the things that they, they really wanted to make sure that it was time for the troops because they had been training and training and training, and then to put it off for almost another month. Um, there were actually um, cargo ships and transport ships in the channel ready to go. They would have had to call them all back, and they just thought the morale would have been just so bad, so they, they made the decision to go on, on uh, the night of the 5th. Okay, so this is another um, picture. So as I was mentioning before, you can see Cherbourg in this picture, um, but it's kind of on the far left. And then Pas de Calais, um, which is actually the shortest crossing point um, between uh, France and England, which is really where the Nazis thought the invasion would occur, um, is up here. So. 
and then training in England. So just go to go back to Corporal Brigham in a little bit. Um, he trained in England from July of 1942 um, through June of 1944. Um, so again, some of the letters that we found um, were talking about this. So, um, so here's some pictures of the preparations, um, which Mr. Byans was kind of just mentioning. Um, so this is them getting onto the ships um, and loading to actually go into Normandy. And so this is Operation Bodyguard. So this was kind of the deception part of the invasion that I was discussing before. Um, so there, the objective of the Allies was to convince the um, Nazi forces that the invasion would occur somewhere else besides the, Nazi, uh, the Normandy coast. Um, so what they actually did was General um, Patton was a general in North Africa during World War II, and he was very successful um, in the Mediterranean in gaining back land um, in Operation Torch. So um, the Nazis knew about this general, and they thought that um, he would be the one leading the invasion into France. So um, what they did was um, they actually chose General Eisenhower to lead the Normandy campaign, and then they stationed General Patton in Dover, um, which is just across from Passe Calais, um, and it's the shorting cross shortest crossing point. Um, so they actually developed uh, um, General Patton's ghost army. So what they did was they actually had um, like movie producers put in these like fake tanks and um, just a lot of infrastructure that would appear as if um, the Allies were preparing for departure from that point. Um, so this is an interesting picture. So they're actually carrying one of these like fake inflatable tanks um, <laughs> with four soldiers. So that's a cool picture. Um, it, and it, then it's an amazing <laughs> story. They would pipe in music to make it sound like they were doing training exercises and working. And uh, even once the invasion actually happened, Hitler said, well, this isn't it. They're still, he still believed they were going to Kali to, to attack because the deception was, was so good. Yeah. It, it, had, it had to be. And um, an interesting figure that we learned about at George Washington was Juan Pujol Garcia. So he was Sp um, a, Span um, a Spaniard, but um, he was not supportive of the Communist Party that was in his country at the time. So he wanted to kind of collaborate with the Allies um, and I think his quote was to do something good for humanity. Um, so what he did, though, um, was he worked with the Allies, and um, but also he convinced the Germans that he was he would be a spy for them, um, since they were collaborating. The Spanish government was collaborating somewhat with the Nazi Party at the time. Um, so. Um, what he did was convince Hitler, um, I believe it was the night before the Normandy invasion, that um, there was going to be an attack at Passai Calais um, two weeks later. So Hitler actually didn't end up sen sending all of the SS units that were up stationed in Passai Calais to Normandy to counter the Allied attack um, because he thought there would be a second invasion. So. Um, this picture was taken in Dover. I'm not sure by who, but yes. Um, so we kind of talked about this before, and we showed that picture. Um, so this was just the decision. And then these are some of the images on the beach. So um, as I was mentioning before, the Atlantic Wall, um, th there were a lot of reinforcements on the beaches. Um, so you can kind of see those here, um, the barbed wire. And then some of the crosses, but you can also see the Allies landing. Um, and we learned a lot about, in our research, about these landing craft um, vehicles. And they had a lot of trouble with those because they were um, getting off of the larger ships when they were coming into Normandy. Um, but they were actually kind of like sinking because um, the waters were so rough at the time because it was kind of just after a storm when they were coming in. Um, so there were actually a lot of those that ended up sinking during that time. And the soldiers themselves, while well, they went through a lot of training, they never trained, at least from my understanding, they had 80 pounds of equipment and supplies on their backs, and once they ended up in the water, they weren't able to get rid of them, and so a lot of them just drowned. They weren't even necessarily shot because they were weighted down so much um, because of the turbulent waters and the tides, and some of the landing crafts got turned around. They didn't end up landing on, their, on the right spot. Um, familiar with the movie Private Ryan? Um, that's one of the uh, things we had to watch, and it's, it's pretty true to that uh, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg used um, the Bedford Boys and the Good War um, 
primary sources of people to actually make that. So it's pretty true to um, what we researched as well. Yeah, it really is. And um, one of the reasons why we saw so much um, like death on the beaches was because um, they thought that they would have like tanks or larger vehicles um, coming in before um, and taking out some of the um, guns that were on the cliffs. Um, but they actually couldn't get those in because, um, as I said before, a lot of the vehicles that were supposed to bring them in in like calm waters were sinking. Um, so the soldiers were getting onto the beaches and they were just alone um, and they didn't have any other support. So. They also expected the, um, the air, air, air traffic to take out some of that and because of the cloud cover, they couldn't fly low enough to get in so they had to be above the clouds because so they missed their, their drop points. Uh, so probably mm -hmm. saw that, uh, private line showed that they're scattered everywhere and nobody was with their right units or battalions and uh, so that, that was a definite difficulty they had to overcome. Yeah, I think I have a picture of us, um, myself, and then some of the other students I met at a hedgerow right. later. Um, but it was actually kind of uh, fortunate uh, that they did miss their dropping points because um, it was kind of more chaotic and uh, the Allies were planning on kind of grouping together, but it was um, the Nazis had already um, experienced the land um, and knew kind of the terrain of the hedgerows, um, which the Allies really didn't know. So. It, um, a lot of the professors that we spoke to actually thought it was very fortunate um, that they were landing at um, di just different spots and attacking from different points um, instead of trying to approach in a more like uniform fashion, um, which was interesting. But, so this is one of the first landing spots, which we kind of talked about before with Cafe Gondre, um, which is shown in the left corner. But it was Pegasus Bridge, and so this is one, one of the first places, or actually the first place, um, for the landing to occur. So these actually occurred late in the night on June 5th. Um, and so what happened was um, there were gliders that landed here um, successfully, and they took these bridges, which prevented the Nazis from um, retreating um, so the Allies could just um, get them before they were able to retreat back into France. And then this is one of the first U.S. landing points um, at St. Mir Glise. Um, uh, so what this is, this is a cathedral there, which is kind of like the town center, um, but there were paratroopers um, that were coming down here um, into this town. Um, there's an interesting story, though. So I don't know if you can see it, but on the top of the cathedral, the point point, oh, yeah. yeah, okay. So like up here, there's a man hanging from one of the, like the steeple. Not a real man. Steeples. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, but what happened was when the paratroopers um, went uh, were coming down into this town, um, he actually got stuck on the cathedral, and he was there for over five hours, um, and he was he acted like he was dead um, to. Um, so that the, the soldiers wouldn't shoot at him, um, but he actually wasn't. So he was actually just hanging there, kind of just observing everything. Um, and there's some interesting accounts from him too. Um, some of you are familiar with The Longest Day, the movie. That's the, that scene in there where he's hanging there. Um, so they still have the, the replica there to, mm -hmm. to, to memorialize him. Yeah. Okay, um, so Another thing that we read about as part of the institute was Marie-Louise Asmont. Um, so who she was was a civilian um, that was in Normandy during the Normandy invasion. Um, and she actually hosted Nazi units and then also allied units at her chateau um, from 1940 all the way through 1946. Um, so her chateau is shown in this center picture up here. Um, and then so we read her diary as part of our research. And then we got to visit her chateau, which is still standing today. And it's actually, it's owned by private owners, so unfortunately we couldn't go in. Um, but it was really interesting to see that. And then um, also her grave. We got to see her grave, which was only several blocks away um, from her house. And um, this year for National History Day, I actually created a performance on Marie-Louise Osmond's experience, um, which you can actually, I believe you can see it out um, there by the National History Day exhibit. So... Okay, um, so this is another spot that we went to, um, Point du Hoc. So what it was, was it was in between Omaha and Utah beaches, um, but what, so the, what the Allies did at this spot was um, the planes that were flying in, um, if they had any bombs left over, um, sorry, excuse me, when they were flying back out to England, they would just drop them at this spot. 
Um, so we were able to go here, and I think this was one of the spots that I would definitely, um, if you're going to Normandy, I would definitely make sure to go here um, because you can really see the devastation that was caused by these bombs. Um, so you can see there were craters all over the place, and there were still some that you actually, um, they recommended you not step in because there could still be explosives in them. Um, but this was just really a neat place to go. And then this is Utah Beach, just some pictures um, from the actual invasion. And this was one of the spots where the US landed. Um, and then this was Utah Beach um, when we went. Um, so you can just see the sign. And then this picture over there, I think Mr. Bynes took that. But it was of uh, myself and then um, three of my other friends from the trip. Well, I wanted the students in the picture. I was kind of to, you know, to project uh, the distance that the soldiers had to travel to get there. Um, it's, it's amazing that everybody wasn't killed. It really was that, that this was successful on these beaches. And so Point to Hawk, they had to climb 100-foot cliffs. Um, and it was just perseverance to, to, to do what they did. It was just amazing. Yeah. OK, and then these are some um, pictures at Omaha Beach. And I believe we found these at the National Archives when we were there. Um, so you can really see like the Atlantic wall defenses over here in this one. Um, and then, but these are also some of the um, actions that the engineers were taking. Um, so what the 342nd did, which was Corporal Joseph Brigham's unit, was they repaired the railroads um, that were taken out um, by the Allies before the invasion um, so that the Nazis couldn't travel um, easily throughout France. Okay, and then the, the, the hedgehogs that you just saw there too yeah. um, referred to um, were those defenses so they can get the tanks on, on board and then uh, talk about the rhino tank, what they use them for. Yeah, right? okay. so, um, so they were having trouble getting through um, hedgerows, which were just essentially large piles of rocks with um, like brush growing over them. Um, so the, the allies couldn't get through these and they were having trouble with these. Um, throughout the Normandy region when they were um, progressing into Normandy. Um, so what they did was they actually attached some of the hedgehogs um, to the tanks, and then they were able to plow through them. Um, oops. Um, I don't know if you can see it really well in this picture, um, but that's what they did, and that, that was really successful. Um, so this, these are the hedgerows, um, and this is myself and then some of the other students. Um, at a hedgerow, and then just some soldiers hiding behind a hedgerow there. The interesting point about the hedgerows is the Allies had such great information from the resistance, but they never were told about the hedgerows. Like, mm -hmm. well, you, everybody knows about them. That's how the French, French countryside is. And once you got through one, you couldn't go over the top because the Nazis would have their guns on the next one. Um, so it was that one difficulty that, like, nobody told us about these. How do we get through this? And the engineers came up with this um, to use the, the, the hedgehogs and made them part of the tanks, and they were able to plow right through them. So. Okay. Um, so just to talk a, a little bit more about Corporal Brigham's experience in Normandy. Um, so he went over on the SS Empire Broadsword, which was a ship um, from England, and then he landed on Utah Beach on June 28, 1944. Um, so since he was an engineer, um, he wasn't coming in right away, but he was more of a support troop. Um, so um, there were actually a lot of different categories of support troops. Um, some brought in oil. Um, some were actually part of this um, express called the Red Ball Express, um, which was a series of drivers um, that, since they didn't have railroads in France, um, because they were destroyed, um, they actually had um, many African American um, units come in and then drive these trucks and supply the troops that were progressing into Germany um, with supplies um, to just reinforce them. Um, but so what Corporal Brigham was doing um, was he was constructing railroads that were taken out. Um, so we found we learned about this through the letters that we got from him. Um, so these were some of the pictures that we found at the National Archives of. Um, what his unit was doing, um, just as, as part of their time in Normandy. So, and then these are some more pictures. So what actually happened to Corporal Joseph Brigham and why he died in this campaign um, was the first thing that we realized be from his um, IDPF, which is an individual deceased personnel file, um, that every um, 
soldier that has fought in conflict in the U.S. has um, at the National Military Archives in St. Louis. So we received this, and then we read a little bit about what happened to him. So he was actually in a hospital in Carentan, France. Um, and what happened was he fell off some sort of tower. And we don't know exactly what kind of tower it was. Um, it was never identified. So what we did at the National Archives was um, if we saw a picture of a tower, um, we took a picture of that picture. And then um, we kind of speculated from there. So um, this was like it could have been like a church tower because he could have been watching um, from a church. And then electrical towers. Um, you can see another one up here, but electrical towers and water towers were often by railroads, so we thought maybe um, it could have been, he could have fallen from that. But so um, while he was in the hospital, he actually contracted pneumonia, and so two weeks after he was in the hospital, um, he died, he actually died um, from pneumonia in Normandy, and so that's um, how he perished. But so then... Um, the last part of our experience in Normandy um, was being able to give a eulogy for him um, to honor his sacrifice um, at the Normandy American Cemetery, which is off of Omaha Beach in Normandy. Um, so what we did here, um, what you can see us doing in the first picture um, is, well, first we went to his grave site, and then they, um, the people we were with brought sand. So we had to um, like rub the sand onto this marble. Otherwise, you couldn't see his name. Um, but so we did that, and then I, I presented the eulogy that we wrote for him um, about his experience. And um, this was just a really powerful experience um, because it was not only me that it was that was giving this eulogy, um, but uh, the 14 other students also. So throughout this day, we heard 15 eulogies for people that we had come to know really, really well, and that had sacrificed um, so much um, their lives um, so that we could have the freedom to do the stuff that we do today um, it was by far the most emotional experience I'm getting choked up now um, not a dry eye when you heard the eulogies and Cecilia did a great job uh, presenting presenting hers it was it was just amazing um, we brought some artifacts his picture we brought a little uh, cow from being from Wisconsin and we were so in the moment that we forgot to put those things out for him and so later on we had sometimes like you know what we forgot to put all that out so we, we made we went back and we're able to do that. Yeah, and then um, you can also see here the French flag right. and the the American flag that we put um, into the ground there. The French flag is actually over on that board over there, um, which is a really cool thing um, that we still have from that experience. But okay. so this is another just image of the Normandy American Cemetery. And, well, okay, just one other interesting thing. When I was there, um, I was considering researching um, one of my uncle's, or one of my dad's friend's uncles who actually died in the invasion also. Um, but it was really interesting because his grave site um, was actually just a couple rows away from Corporal Joseph Brigham's, so I got to see his site also while I was there. So that was really nice. And then um, there's still a memorial for Corporal Joseph Brigham um, in Cache in Wisconsin at St. Peter and Paul Cemetery at Pine Hollow where all of his family was buried. Um, so this is just an image of that headstone, um, which we haven't visited yet, but we'd like to visit this summer. Um, so this is another story. So through NHD, National History Day, um, probably our experience was the eighth year that the, the Normandy trip had been going, and uh, I think it was probably five years prior to that, a student, I think from, she was from Nebraska, was researching, um, I don't remember which one, let's, one of the Piper twins, and uh, they were both stationed together, they're uh, twins, and um, both uh, perished uh, going over across the English Channel, um, and she was researching the one twin who was found, and the remains of the other were, were never found. Um, about 1962, they think they found the remains of um, the, uh, the brother, um, never were really able to identify it. But through the research of this student, yes, they were able to identify that this was Julius and Ludwig. And um, the week that we were um, in George Washington, CBS News ran this um, 
news uh, article that now the two brothers were united once again. So uh, the military never puts twins together, but mom kind of requested that. They kind of died the same. And you can see that the grave here has just been, been laid uh, within weeks. And um, one of our, le our leaders, um, Lino Hara, gave the eulogy for, for him. So uh, we were able to experience it. And it was pretty close to uh, Corporal Brigham's um, site as well. So uh, it was pretty neat, something that came out of this NHD that, to unite the brothers again. Uh, and kind of was yeah. kind of a, a national national story, so yeah. we got to experience that. Yeah. So this is Bayou. This is where we um, stayed in France, and like I said, um, it was largely untouched, um, unlike other cities by the Normandy uh, invasion. Um, so this is this is our hotel, but then this is the Notre Dame Cathedral um, in Bayou, um, which is actually o older than. Um, the uh, one in Paris. And then this is myself and some of the other students I met. Um, one is from New Mexico, one's from Minnesota. Um, but they were from all over the country, so it was a great experience to meet people who are also really passionate about history and who had been involved in the National History, history Day program. Um, so that's Bayou. Um, this is the Bayou Tapestry, which is one of the things um, that was still preserved um, despite the Normandy invasion, which was nice to, and it, um, I believe it um, depicted William the Conqueror's um, invasion mm -hmm. of England. Okay. Um, these are just a few more pictures of Bayou. This was our favorite restaurant. <laughs> it was a creperie, so <laughs> we enjoyed that. Um, and then this is Monet's Gardens, um, which we got to stop in. Um, it's kind of between Normandy and Paris. So if you're traveling from Paris to Normandy, I would highly recommend stopping here. Um, but it's where Monet um, gained the inspiration for the Water Lilies series of paintings. Um, so that was a really cool place to it see. Was, it was kind of unexpected. It wasn't on our schedule, and we got to stop there. And mm -hmm. Pretty neat. And I was actually in Cleveland a couple weeks later, um, and they have one of the water lily paintings. Um, so I saw like the inspiration and then the actual painting, which was really neat. But, um, so then we stopped in Paris on our last day. Um, and we didn't have a lot of time there, but it was still really neat to see this. Um, we got to see Paris in three hours. So yeah. if you're going there, yeah. take more time than that, I would suggest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we saw the Eiffel Tower, and then um, we Went to the Notre Dame, Notre Dame, which was really a neat experience. Um, and we're really glad that we got to see that, um, considering what's happening now. So, um, And then now, um, some significant dates. So last year was the 100th anniversary of the Armistice of World War I. And um, this year, it's actually the 75th anniversary of D-Day, um, which is something that's really important and that we should remember. and. Um, just be very grateful for the sacrifice that these soldiers did give in the war. Um, and then Veterans Day on November 11th. Um, so um, I just always remember that day because that's the day that Corporal Joseph Bergman actually passed away. Um, but that, so that's really important. And then um, if we keep going. It was interesting because it took us a while to kind of, you know, recognize, oh, November 11th, Veterans Day. Yeah. That's when he died. And so that was pretty neat. Um, and then, yeah, thank a veteran for their service. Um, 